Okay, so now we have our basic concept of our paper, and we also have some platforms um, by which we're going to, to get started. Uh, so now you're going to sit down and you're going to write, okay? Uh, there are some things, there are some mistakes that people make very, very commonly. Uh, there are some, some words that quite simply you should just stay away from because they're not part of good scientific English. So I'm going to give you uh, four slides of uh, kind of basic writing tips for scientific writing in English. Okay, so this is your first slide of things to avoid. So let's discuss the word while. Um, essentially, this is a word that gets abused quite a bit in scientific English. Uh, don't use this word to mean although. Really what this word means is at the same time as. So I went to the store while my friend went to the restaurant. Uh, many times, you don't need to use it at all. You can simply use a semicolon. But again, this is a word that gets overused. A second little bit of wisdom is the use of these two abbreviations, EG and IE. Um, EG means exempli gratia, or for example. And so it introduces some examples, some instances, or a short list of of names or items. IE, on the other hand, means id est, or that is. And so that's going to essentially introduce a restatement of something. So make the difference. EG is giving, is, is a saying, for example, and IE is restating. Don't use one for the other. Notice that both of the words in both of these uh, abbreviations are abbreviated, and so both of them should have periods. Uh, whether there's a comma after them depends on the specific journal's style. Then we get into this pair of words, compose versus comprise. Uh, comprise is basically saying including. So comprising is embracing or taking in, Whereas composing is making up. And so one is the whole encompassing the parts, and the other is the parts making up the whole. So make sure you use these two carefully, and also don't use comprised of. Okay? A third set of words of wisdom are the, these causal things, because, since, as. Uh, these, are, these are conjunctions that express reason or cause. Uh, perhaps the strongest of the three is because. This happened because that happened. So that's direct attribution of cause. Since is a bit more uh, shallow and weak. Uh, what follows is implied by what precedes. And as is very subtle and very um, soft. So kind of use those three in the right places. Finally, let's talk about although and though. They're largely interchangeable. Uh, but when you're beginning a clause, it can be better to use although because it's a bit more emphatic and a bit clearer. So that's a first set of bits of wisdom about words to use and words not to use. There's a second set of words to avoid. Uh, the word very, almost always, you can just remove it. If I say values of the index were very high, that's not a lot less communicative of as uh, values of the index were high. And so you don't gain very much by this extra word. Similarly, in English we have this construction, there is and there are. Um, for example, there are 30 birds sitting on the wire. Well, why don't we just use a more direct statement? 30 birds are sitting on the wire. I've found that in essentially every instance, I can find a more effective and more direct way of wording something uh, 
without there is and there are. So think about that when you read through your papers. Then we have these pronouns, this, these, those, as nouns. Uh, these are actually modifiers. They're not nouns. But people often say, this is why I, no. This reason is why, or this problem is why. Uh, but don't use them as nouns. Next, passive verbs versus active verbs. Most of the time, when we use a passive construction, like this bird was processed by these approaches, we can restate exactly the same sense as we used these approaches to process this bird. So there's no good reason why you should load your text with these kind of backwards constructions, which are passive verbs. Last on this slide is et al. This comes from the Latin et altera, or and others. So we say this when we have multiple co-authors. We say Johnson et al. Okay, but that means al is short for altera. Et is not. Okay, so al needs to have a period so that it reflects the fact that it's an abbreviation, unless your journal expressly uh, does not use that format. I see very frequently things like this. We're not even going to talk about that. Johnson et al. A -L -L. Uh, but just understand that this comes from et altera, and then you'll never have problems with remembering how et al. should be. Okay? That's words to avoid number two. Now let's go on to number three. Here's a third set of uh, bits of wisdom about scientific writing. Very commonly, you'll see this construction of due to. Um, and most uses of this construction really should be replaced with owing to, because of. Uh, because due to really implies more that a quantity is owed. Um, Whereas what we really want to express is one of causation. Okay, then spaces after periods and colons. Um, back when my career was beginning, we still had to put two spaces after a colon and two spaces after a period. That really was related to how type was set, how publishing was done. Um, these days, your word processing program probably accords a bit of extra space after periods and after colons automatically. So those two spaces are not necessary. But really, what it comes down to is be consistent. If you're going to do it one way, do it that way, all the way through the entire manuscript, absolutely consistently. Then we have uh, British versus uh, US English spelling. Um, I'm from the U.S., so obviously I prefer the, the U.S. spelling, but a colleague of mine from, from Great Britain would see the world uh, quite differently. Neither is correct. Uh, each one is correct if that's what the journal is, is requesting. But these are pairs of uh, British versus American uh, spelling. One of the most common ones that we see is acknowledgement with or without the E. Well, that's not a matter of, of preference. It's simply, what's the style of your journal? You can write in British English. You can write in American English. The important thing is, do it consistently, one or the other. And then it's always very easy to go back and forth. So when we talk about uh, modifiers, Sometimes we have modifiers that consist of multiple parts. And it's convenient um, to connect those with a hyphen. That's what we're talking about with these hyphenated compound modifiers. So we could say that man is well respected. And the only modifier we have is, well, well is, res is modifying respected and respected man. But it's quite clear that that man is well-respected. But if we want to combine well-respected into a modifier for man, then it's convenient to include a hyphen. This is a, this is a detail, but it can, 
it can avoid the, conclu the, the confusion of he is a well-respected man or is he is a well-respected man. So just be thinking about how you can use hyphens in moderation to clear up some of your modifiers. That's a third set of, of words to avoid and problems to avoid. Let's go on to a fourth. Okay, here's our fourth and final list of, of little quibbles with scientific English. Um, the use of the word where. Where refers to location. Don't use it to refer to things that are better dealt with as in which or for which. So for example, you might see the sentence, predation on small prey where many individuals must be captured for a dive, blah, 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 blah. Well, that's not re referring to a place. It is referring to this, this quality of predation on small prey. And so much better would be predation on small prey in which many individuals must be captured for a dive. So again, use where for location. Predate um, actually should be pronounced predate, uh, and it means something that happened in advance of another thing. The verb that refers to predation is depredate. Another quibble is monophyletic clade. Well, guess what? A clade is by, de by definition monophyletic. So just get rid of monophyletic. If you're going to use the word clade, we know you're saying that it's monophyletic. The word data, very, very common in science. Remember that the word data is plural. If it's plural, then it requires plural forms of verbs after it. And the singular is datum. When you refer to a single piece of data, you literally have to say data, not data. The word the is vastly overused. When I do an editing pass through a manuscript, I can usually remove 30, 40, 50% of the uses of the word the. It's generally not necessary. Split infinitives. The infinitive is here to divide, but here it's been split using an adverb blatantly, it's just an ugly use of, of a construction in English. Um, to divide the word blatantly, or to divide blatantly the word, it may be a little more cumbersome, but it's a lot less ugly. And finally, we have a whole set of considerations about hyphens and dashes. Uh, hyphens are used to build compound modifiers. Then these short dashes that are called n dashes are used to indicate ranges of numbers, like here, 4 to 5. And then the longer m dashes are used, uh, essentially, to subset sentences, like I ate more than anything because I was hungry. These are m dashes. OK, so that was a little bit long and tedious, but that was a whole set of suggestions that you can use to improve your written English. What I would suggest to you as you get these and other suggestions into your writing uh, brain, I would suggest that you write your manuscript and then you go back through it. For example, you could uh, search clade and make sure you don't have monophyletic. You could search where, and just make sure you're happy with its use at each instance in which you use it.